Go ahead and open the meeting. We can please all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll have a brief moment of silence. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, we'll get started this evening with the hearing of citizens. Are there any three-minute speakers that would like to be heard? <clears throat> Seeing none. We will move on. I believe our first item this evening is special education recommendations by Dr. Kennedy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for giving me a few minutes tonight to talk to you about a reorganization proposal that we have for the special education department. And you want to sit at the one of the empty seats. Go oh. ahead. That might be more comfortable. It's up to you. Okay. okay. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> So for the past several years, at least as many years as I've been in this department, we've pretty much been operating in crisis mode because we didn't really have the resources that we needed to address our problems the way that we wanted to. So we kind of did a lot of putting out fires and kind of, you know, plugging the leaks in the dam type of thing. And um, but recently, the superintendent and the assistant superintendent challenged us to start thinking differently and imagine a world with no barriers. And in a world like that, what would we need to move our department, and most importantly, our students forward? So we began with a vision of what we ultimately like our program to be. Am I clicking this? Okay. Yep. <laughs> you can do this. The green one or the move or the arrows? The arrow. Okay, thank you. So we began with a vision of what we ultimately like our program to be. Green one or the arrow? The arrow. Where am I pointing at? Okay, here it is. Okay, so starting with our department vision, this is what we would like to see ourselves look like and we be reflective of in the future. Um, we'd like to offer a full continuum of services and supports in all of our schools. We'd like to see our IEPs be compliant and quality IEPs that position our students to make meaningful progress in their curriculum. We want research-based curriculum with high-quality instructional materials provided to all of our teachers and our students with consistency across all programs. We want our schools equipped with appropriate support, including professional learning, resources, and certified staff to promote successful special education programs, teachers, and students <laughs> in all of our buildings. We want to build strong relationships and collaboration with our stakeholders to support the development of skills and assets that will allow our students to be successful academically, socially, and behaviorally. We want all of our students to graduate, or in the case of our specialized programs, a lot of times those students age out when they're 21. But we want all of them positioned for successful post-secondary outcomes. And we want to strengthen our systems and structures to ensure the realization of these big outcomes. In the short term, however, we have some more immediate challenges. Okay, so some of our more immediate challenges include our graduation rates, which we definitely need to increase, and we want to decrease our dropout rates. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. At one time, I just thought those two things corresponded, you know, directly, but they don't exactly because dropout rates um, impact students ages 14 through 21 who, for one reason or another, leave the district, but we don't know and where they continue if they continue. So those count against us with dropout rates, but still, it's still reflective of our, our graduation rates as well. We obviously want to improve our growth and proficiency rates of our students with IEPs, just like we do all of our students. Uh, we also need to remediate our significant disproportionality. We recently learned that we are now in corrective action for our African-American subgroup with IEPs for total removals. So, um, We've exceeded the risk ratio of 2.5% for three consecutive years in 2019, 2020, and 2021. So that puts us, um, you know, in the red flag category. Um, and I'm going to refer to Ms. this can to I, you, Teresa, because yeah. can I just interject yeah. one thing? The um, I want to make sure everybody understands the risk ratio. That's what I wanted you to do. Uh, so the risk ratio. Looking at that, um, what that that shows us is our black students with IEPs 
um, are two, in 2019 were 2.61 times more likely to be excluded from school suspension or expulsion. 2020, 4.24 times, and 2021, 2.66. We, we want to make sure we understood that. Yeah. It's not a percentage. Yeah, we think that 2020 had something to do with the COVID shutdown and the fact that we brought our special education students back sooner than our other students. So we think that's why there was such a significant jump, but still, you know, we still exceeded the risk ratio. Can I ask a question compared to Black students without IEPs, or compare what's the comparison there? Comparison to all the other, all of the other kids that would not fall in that group with IEPs. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And some more bar media challenges. We were monitored this year by the Department of Ed. And they did find that we had some issues with non-compliant IEPs and IEPs that weren't being appropriately implemented. Also, some of our students weren't making meaningful progress. We had some students that had the same goals in, in maybe two or three consecutive years and, and they made minimal progress. And actually, just to be perfectly frank with you, um, several times when I've come before you to um, a good settlement agreements you know, with parents who were dissatisfied with um, their students' um, progress in their programs, it had to do with one or more of these issues. So, can, can you give an example of a non-compliant IEP? Um, so an IEP that maybe the present levels are not reflective of current progress. Sometimes, unfortunately, our IEP writer system has a tendency to just regenerate information. And sometimes our teachers don't update that information. Um, sometimes we have needs reflected in our present levels and then we don't have a goal that corresponds with that. Sometimes our transition goals you know, are not reflective of, you know, the post-secondary outcomes that we want to see for our students. Um, progress monitoring might not be measurable. Um, so those are all types of things that could be reflective of a non-compliant IEP. And, and I'm going to interject, Edie, yeah. just from what I see. Um, students with IEPs who have behavioral issues that impact their learning or that of others, um, the IEP should have database positive behavior support plan components within the IEP. Sure. And and that's something that is time consuming and often gets left behind sure. in Erie. I got gotcha. you. You got me? Great, thank you. Okay. So our team did some reflection on this around, you know, what, what do we need to meet our challenges and, and you know realize our vision in the long term. And what we determined is that we do, we need some additional leadership support that will assist us in implementing and sustaining a structure that supports our students and holds us accountable in meeting our student goals. So what we want that leadership to be able to, to do is support our special and regular education teachers, um, provide ongoing professional learning around co-teaching, differentiated instruction, provision of support, um, especially, this is really important and key, um, provision of support by general education teachers to students with IEPs. Because a lot of times general education teachers don't come to us you know, from their teacher prep programs with that type of, you know, of knowledge and, and experience. Also intentional and immediate feedback around their professional learning, um, ensuring that IEP compliance and appropriate implementation of the IEPs. We need to increase our parent and student engagement and um, be able to provide accountability and effective response. So one of the things, another thing that we did was we looked at what some like districts in the state, um, we looked at their leadership structures and, and what they're doing. And one of the school, school districts that stood out to us was Lancaster because they're very like us demographically, but they have some better performance outcomes in some critical indicators such as dropout rates. Maybe you can see that their dropout rate in the most recent um, available data date um, time frame was significantly less than ours. And then in the next slide, their graduation rates over the four and five and six year cohorts were, were greater than ours. So we wondered, well, what do they have <laughs> that we don't have? Just a reminder to the board, we, we often use Lancaster as an example because they, as you said, they're very similar to us. Mm -hmm. And they also came out of the financial crisis, but they came out of the 10 years before us. So they had more time to really implement systems and we get them in place and they've done that successfully. Excuse me, Brian, can I interject for a minute? Angie, could you slow down? Oh, am I going too fast? Yes. Am I talking for me, too fast? you are going too fast. Okay, so sorry. Yeah. 
we're almost to the end now. She told me sooner because we're almost to the end now. So um, what we, we wondered is, you know, what do they have that we don't have? And what we found is that they have this additional layer of special education leadership that's primarily focused at the building level. And that's those, um, what you see there is the exceptional student specialists. Um, and those are the people who are going in and providing support in the classrooms in the general and regular education, um, general and special education classrooms and um, working with the general ed and regular education and special ed students and teachers, um, making sure that IEPs are implemented appropriately and making sure that IEPs are compliant and that progress monitoring is happening and is measurable. Um, you know, doing all those things that we would like to do, but we just don't have the resources to do. Um, they also have um, behavior analysts, and you know, we have right now a point, we're calling it a 0.5 contracted behavior analyst um, that we contract for, um, that it's not really enough to meet our needs. They have three. Um, they also have four supervisors, JAR 3.25 school age supervisors. It's the 0.25 is because we have one supervisor who's primarily focused on early intervention. And so she does assist us with the school age needs, you know, as, as she's able. But for the most part, we have three supervisors who are focusing on our school age needs. So we're asking for two additional. This is um, behavior analysts? Oh, sure. Yeah, the behavior analysts. Um, so I know that you guys are aware of behavior specialists that we have in our district, but behavior analysts are a little bit different. Behavior analysts have specific credentials that, you know, enable them to have the training and experience that um, they can address the needs of students with disabilities whose behaviors are a manifestation of those disabilities as opposed to just conduct disorder, which a lot of times behavior specialists are addressing conduct disorder issues where behavior analysts are you know, addressing much more intense behaviors and they're using research-based um, strategies to do so. Um, so it's a big ask and I, is there a, is there, is this the updated one? I think there was, That's the last one. I, I think there was a number at, at the bottom of That's that. That's the most updated one. Yeah. Is it yeah. there? Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. So, um, in, in a world with no barriers, <laughs> this is what our ask would be, but it does come with a pretty significant price tag. Um, that's $2.8 million a year. We uh, mentioned this on Saturday. We're not going to put this in uh, because we don't know if we're going to get any additional funding from the state. If we do get additional level funding like we have received in the last two years, uh, this would be our number one priority to, to focus on. And just as a reminder, last year we received about six million dollars in federal funding and then before that it was about four million dollars. So I'm sure you have questions for me. So, Dr. Maggie, could you um, explain what an exceptional student specialist is or like are they a lot of different categories or well that's that layer, that additional layer of leadership support. That's what Lancaster like, calls them. Those are people who are primarily, they're focused in the building. You know, they're working in the buildings with the students, with the teachers, you know, providing, you know, professional learning and immediate feedback and, and they're working directly. So would that be like a paraeducator or no? no. Okay. No, we okay. Have, it has to be some level of administrative support because they're going to have to be able to give teachers direction with regard to their IEPs and, you know, that type of thing. So, you know, I don't know that we've exactly determined what type of, you know, leadership level that'll be, but they have to be able to give direction to teachers. Thank you. Did they also get involved with uh, communication with parents? I don't want to say no, not at all, because I think, yeah, I think that's an important piece of it, that, you know, parents have somebody to talk to directly at the, the building level that will have, you know, a, an intimate knowledge of special education. However, I want to stop short of saying that they could act as an LEA. In, the, in an IEP meeting, there has to be somebody present who can commit the resources of the district, you know, when you're discussing the program of, uh, of a student and what that might, you know, what that might look like. So I don't think that these people are going to be acting as LEAs. I think that's still going to be a function of the special ed supervisor and in some cases the principal or the assistant principal, but I don't see the exceptional student specialist as acting as LEAs. Sorry, Jay raised. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Summer. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised at the dropout rate. 
being 31%. Now that would be, these students have up to six years to complete high school or? I mean, it's a little misleading because actually, I mean, a lot of our students age out. They can stay, out, 21, they can stay right? to 21 and there's no seven year cohort. But still, Lancaster's doing better than we are at the four, five, and six year cohort. So when we have a 30%, those are, uh, a lot of those would be students who stayed the whole time to 21 but didn't get enough credits to graduate? That's or, a good question. I'm not 100% sure that they count for our dropout rate. I know they don't help us. But I'm not as far as our graduation rate, but I'm not 100% sure if they count towards our dropout rate. That would be something I'd have to probably get each of Berlin to weigh in on. And, and why did they leave? Are they obtaining jobs? That's the main reason they're leaving? Do they stay till they're 21? Well, it's along the way. I mean, why Why are they leaving? That's a good question. I mean, sometimes we, you know, sometimes we don't know. Sometimes it's because they don't have enough credits to graduate, and they know they don't have enough credits to graduate, so they end up you know, dropping out, and that's what we want to be able to remediate. You know, in some cases, we do have kids that have jobs, and we work really closely with those kids to make sure that we do provide them, because we, you can graduate a student on the goals of their IEP, but we don't like to do that, because we don't want to just send a kid out into the world, you know, with minimal credits, and say, oh, well, he graduated on his IEP, but we do look at cases where maybe there's sometimes, you know, kids have kids, you know, and sometimes they do have jobs. And we work with those kids because we do want them to be successful. So we work with them to make sure that they, you know, they can, you know, graduate. You can you can graduate on your IEP program. Well, do you know if Allentown calculates it differently than we do? I don't know that. But we don't do that. We don't. At this time. Very okay. very minimally. We do it very. We, we don't like to do that because we don't think it's right. I'm going to go to Mr. Brenneman here, but before I do, doesn't the state calculate the dropout rate? We don't do that ourselves, correct? Okay, thank you. Sorry, Jay, thanks for waiting. You're up. That's okay. I'm not going anywhere. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, just uh, two questions. The one, probably a shorter one, but uh, how was the ratio of, of um, staff worked out to students? I see that, you know, the... Um, the high high school versus middle elementary, the numbers don't really. I mean, is that is that based on a certain percentage, based on a need? Um, it's, it's, need based. it's needs based, you know, based on you know conversations that our special ed team has had with building administrators and teachers, and, and so it's it's more of a needs based thing than any specific ratio. Okay, and as I, in my understanding, that um, the students who. Uh, utilize the IEP or served by IEP, those are the ones where parents have volunteered and signed up for it or agreed to it, correct? Okay, oh, yeah. and so does that, if, if we had a robot, a more robust support system in place, does that mean that we could also see a potential increase in the number of students that are served um, by the program, the number of students who are, maybe they, because I, I hear this for teachers and parents as well, there's children that and students that need served, but maybe they don't they don't have you know IEP or anything else for whatever reason. Well, I I mean I can't I mean I can't give you specifics on that, but I, what I can say is that's a good point because if we have these people working with our general education teachers as well as our special education teachers, I think the skills that they could you know help them to obtain would help you know, students that are struggling that might not qualify for IEPs as well. That much I can I can envision happening. Okay, thank you. Madam President, um, as any good plan has, who helped you construct this plan? Were, you, were the supervisors? Did you have surveys go out to there? Yeah, as a matter of fact, Rosa. So where is that data showing? Well, our survey, I'm just going to be honest with you. We did have surveys because we were monitored this year. So as part of that, we do have to send out surveys to teachers and to parents, you know, and the building administrators. And we do have our surveys from that we could show you from our teachers and our building administrators, but we didn't get a good return from the parents. So what our response to that was going to be is that at IEP meetings, we're going to offer those surveys, you know, to the parents at the IEP meetings since we didn't get a good return on those surveys. Okay, so tell me exactly what you're asking us for. You're asking us for another supervisor. 
Actually, which two? There's how, and I, I don't mean to throw this out there, this but there are some questions on supervisors not supervising. So how do you plan on planning with them to get better out there with the kids and their staffs? Well, like, I mean, there's problems with that. Well, I think, and this is my opinion, obviously you might get a different perspective from another, you know, from another, um, another group of you know, people that you're talking to. But in my perspective, if people, if our supervisors aren't as effective as they could be, it's because they're spread too thin. You know, I mean, having a supervisor, having one supervisor who's, you know, with the, for the high school, for PJD, for one of the middle schools, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of, of, you know, students, a lot of issues, a lot of parents to deal with, a lot of, you know, teachers to deal with. I, I feel that it's because they're spread too thin. And I think if we had some more support and we had that support at the building level, that we wouldn't have those issues. Okay, so continue. What else? You're asking for more supervisors? Two, and then we're asking to have uh, um, to have these exceptional student specialists. So Lancaster has 21. We're asking for 17. Four at for Erie High, one for each grade level. Three, so one for each of the middle schools, and then 10 to service the elementary schools. Okay, so what do these people do? Are they like lead teachers? Do they go into the classrooms and work with yeah, the regular ed teachers and the special yeah, ed teachers. But I can't call them lead teachers because, as I said, you know, when Lauren asked, they would have to have some level of supervisory role because they have to be able to to give teachers some direction when it comes to their regular IT. So I can't really call them lead teachers. So we have to pay them as supervisors. Well, I think we're talking about what level of you know what level of administrative yeah, that would be. The, like the lower level of administration type positions. And then the behavior analysts. Explain what those are. So the behavior analysts, I know. How many of those? Seven is what we're asking for. Um, so, yeah. So behavior analysts, as I said, they're, you know, I know you've heard of behavior specialists and we've worked with behavior specialists, right? But behavior analysts have a different level of credential and a different level of training and a different level of experience. It's a, they're master's level people who have to go for additional training to become certified behavior analysts. And their training involves, you know, learning about applied behavior analysis and research-based techniques and determining what the function of a behavior and then implementing scientifically based strategies to address those behaviors, ongoing data collection, revision of the program. And also part of their role is to train, you know, train other people, our teachers, our, our paraprofessionals, you know, our administrators in how to implement those same programs. So they would just work with the special ed kids. Yes, that would be our intention. They would work with our kids to have the most intensive behavior issues. So you wouldn't piggyback then the behavior people working with special ed kids. This would be their special ed yes, behavior. That's the thought. Madam President. Yes. Just from a legal perspective, Rose, mm -hmm. um, what I chimed in before, like I said, for every child with an IEP, one of the one of the issues that the IEP team has to look at is whether that child is exhibiting behaviors that that um, are restricting their behavior or that of others. And if the answer to that question is yes, and there are many students in the Erie School District that the answer to that question is yes, then by law the district is required to conduct what's called a functional behavioral assessment, and then from that data then they, they create a data-driven positive behavior support plan. That's where these certified behavior analysts are massively helpful. And it's, we really, schools really need that level of expertise um, to, to get that data and then to help the special ed teachers apply that data in an effective way. That's, and the reason why I talk about it the way I do, I'm not a teacher, um, but just from the legal perspective, that's, that's a very common issue in, in defending lawsuits that are brought against school districts when that's not done effectively. But we've been requiring teachers to do that now, a functional behavior assessment You're for right a long now. time. But I'm gonna be honest with you in that they're not as, those, those plans are not as effective as they could be. 
And isn't it true that some of those teachers are really not trained in that particular area? Mm -hmm. And that's where it all falls into. Uh, we're putting Sumner as the quarterback. He ain't got no training. So you have teachers who are, no disrespect, <laughs> you have teachers <laughs> who are doing things and they're doing it to the best of their ability because they have a special education degree, but they didn't go further to receive the required training. So we're putting a hurry on some of our students by not having that specialized training. And one thing we also need to look at and remember is just that the students of special education, you're also looking at the students of special education who are gifted. That falls up under special education. So right now, from what I'm hearing, we're talking about the students who are in educational danger or in need, but we're not speaking of the students who are gifted because they're part of the special education program too, correct? Some are. Well, and you know, I think everybody has recognized that since the pandemic, I mean, our mental health issues and substance and behavior issues have just increased exponentially, um, you know, to a level that we haven't seen in the past. Okay, I see your hand up again. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, two more questions. Uh, one being, uh, you know, the workforce is a hot mess right now. I guess I don't need to say, I, mo most people already know that. If we were to post these jobs today, what's the likelihood that we get the right uh, credentialed applicants in, in a time frame? Are we looking at a year or two? I mean, what, what are we looking at as far as like before we'd actually be able to build out uh, this team? Yeah, so a couple things. I think, first of all, I'd have to, you know, ask the superintendent and Neil when they think that we might possibly, you know, be in a position to be able to hire these people. Second of all, you're right. You know, it, it's slim pickings out there. And I have to be honest with you in saying that the people who we would attract would probably, if we offer, you know, the right salary level, um, could be possibly people who would be attracted to the school schedule because, you know, they have young children. Um and also, I think that we probably are going to be stealing people from, you know, from, you know, area agencies that would be attracted to working, you know, more in a school setting as opposed to a clinical setting. Not stealing, but attracting. Okay. Yeah. They, yeah. Well, you know, again, that's almost how it is in this environment as it is anyways. Um, the, the other question I had was, so I, I know teachers are, are very crunched with time as it is, and is there a, I know you know, this, and I guess just from the plan from seeing, we're seeing more uh, professionals, more, you know, paraprofessionals, et cetera, stepping in, assisting. H how much of this is a uh, reducer of workload on teachers uh, versus sort of maintaining the same sort of uh, load that the teachers are bearing? I mean, reducing the workload, I think that what it can do is to help teachers to be able to manage, you know, their their classroom situations better, especially when they have very challenging students. And I think when they have the skills to do that, first of all, that's a reduction of stress level right there. And also we're going to make sure that they're using, you know, effective research based practices. So they're not implementing, you know, um, strategies that you know aren't going to be aren't going to work for them. So I think in the long run, it will reduce stress levels and it will reduce, you know, the, the workload on teachers because they'll have the appropriate supports and appropriate professional learning to work smarter, not harder. Other questions for Dr. Kanaki? I've got one. Mm -hmm. Why just not hire more special ed teachers to make your class sizes smaller and make the work easier for them? I still think that you know, I, I mean, it would save a lot more money. Our I, class sizes, uh, on average, compared to peer groups, are actually actually lower. How much? Um, if we're floating around on average about fifteen students per special. Ed. So why not just like you do for regular ed, lower? But well, you know, a lot of most of our students are educated in the regular ed setting, so it's not just a matter of hiring more special ed teachers. You know, because you know, we're targeting really the kids that are in the general ed settings, and those are the kids that we're losing. 
those are the kids who aren't getting enough chance <coughs> to graduate and you know the ones that need more support in the general ed setting and that's this is the way that we get Lancaster is telling us that they were able to make that happen. Make more sense to pull the kids together in small groups if you had more people. Well, Member President, I, I think um, Rose, the, the the way we're thinking is the, the model and the strategic plan to strengthening that infrastructure. Um, I, I, we, we don't think that the, the challenges we're seeing will be solved with additional additional teachers. Um, you know, looking at the, the number of students um, and you know some of the, the condition paperwork is in and things that we've talked about before with the, the monitoring. Um, you know, we, we really need the we need a layer of people to hold the teachers accountable. Um, you know, a lot of the the cases we do see for suspension and expulsion when you know we dig into the positive behavior support plans, they're they're incomplete, and um, it, it often turns into with two thousand three hundred some kids. I, pardon this expression, but whack a mole to to try and and hit all of this. Um, so that's I think why we went in the direction more of having that, that layer, um, and then you know once the system and structure started to to strengthen, um, maybe revisiting it. Other questions for Dr. Kanaki? I guess I want to say um, this is such an important topic, and there's, I would say, pretty not heated, but emotional conversation about this because I think we know it impacts so many of our kids. I appreciate everybody's questions today. I would like to ask, you know, the superintendent. So I heard you say we won't put it in the budget. Um, do we have a backup plan? Or if we don't get the level of funding, will you come back to us with a revised proposal? Because I just don't feel like we can keep going the way we've been going. Well, we I, I think that we would probably have to look. Um, I'd like to get through the, the first part of the budget first to see where we are and what kind of tax increase we need uh, moving forward to to balance the budget as is. And once we're, we have a better handle on that, then we can have a discussion about if we could not, if we don't get the level of funding, we could not afford the tax increase. So I'm, I'm very confident with the, the fair funding lawsuit and what I've been hearing about the budget um, so far this year that there's going to be funding in there for this thing and hopefully a pretty significant down payment on uh, the, the inequitable funding that's, that's happened. And maybe it's a reminder to us as board members as we advocate for that level of funding when we talk about using it for something this important to this many of our students <laughs> help, helpful to make the case that this is what a district like Erie would use that for so did you have something Mr. Shree? No I just uh this is such a you know important topic uh, like how how long can we just put it because I hear a lot of frustration from parents like how long are we going to keep putting off the budget because it seemed like this is something that needs to be done. No. Like the, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Our budget <laughs> process every year starts in April. So next month you'll get your first look at, at the budget. And we'll we'll revisit it again in May the board adopts a preliminary budget in May and has to adopt the final budget by June 30th. So um, during this next three months, we'll be able to really see where we are financially and then start to make some of those decisions. Everyone okay to move on? Thank you, Dr. Kanaki. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll move on then to item four, the future ready PA index designations. Ms. Wigala. Thank you, Ms. Devlin. Um, so I will be reporting out on um, PDE school improvement and accountability. Um, this was on pause since the pandemic, so we haven't seen this in, since uh, since 2019. So I'm going to just do a brief overview. Um, so you have a general understanding of how this process works. And um, then I will get to the, some of the designations we have for our schools um, starting uh, this year. So um, these, these slides actually are from PDE's presentation. I thought they were important for the, the group to know. Um, identifying schools for supports termed annual meaningful differentiation by the federal statute. That's 
ESSA. Um, it results in three federally prescribed designations, which we're going to talk about. I'm going to use the acronyms here, CSI, ATSI, and um, TSI. Pennsylvania's approach to um, ESSA and school improvement. It's important to, to stay in the mindset that this process is for schools and systems to strengthen. We talk about that a lot. Um, it, is, it should not be viewed as punitive. It's important to understand it's a collaborative, collaborative effort to, um, to work on those systems and structures in our schools. What I usually refer to as that outer layer, that infrastructure and the strategic plan. So a little bit deeper, dig a little bit deeper into the, the designations. CSI is Comprehensive Support and Improvement. It's the most intense layer of uh, support for schools facing the biggest challenge. The bottom 5% we save. Um, ATSI is Additional Targeted Support and Improvement. It focuses on the student groups that are performing below the level of CSI. So again, student groups are subgroups that are performing below 5% or in the bottom 5%. Um, CSI and TSI are both designations that last three years. So this designation would go from 2023 until 2026. Um, TSI is a little bit more on the local level. Um, the focus is on student groups as well, um, below state established standards, which I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. How did we get here? Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act designation process, we've got two Two layers here. We've got the indicators and the three step system. So I'm going to go over what the indicators are first. If you see on the left, we have the, the, federal, um, the federal indicators that we have to have when we're reviewing our data. Achievement, academic progress, which is our growth, graduation rate, average of four and five year cohort rates, and English language, I'm sorry, English, English learner proficiencies at the bottom there. Um, additional indicators that were selected by PA are career readiness and chronic absenteeism. Now that we know the indicators, let's talk briefly about the three-step system. So ESSA requires states to disaggregate data based on their subgroups. Um, so that's what we're looking at when we're looking at TSI schools. So a student group, which is 20 or more, if they exhibit achievement at or below the statewide achievement rate, they then go into another layer where we look at achievement growth together. So the student group falls within a specific achievement academic growth profile. If they don't meet the standard on either of those, then they fall into the range and they're evaluated on the remaining indicators. <clears throat> These are the remaining indicators that, um, again, we need to look at. So if you meet the criteria in the first two steps, and you also a school also performed below state averages for either ESSA required indicator or both state selected indicators, the school will be placed in TSI. So again, the ESSA required indicators is the graduation, the cohort graduation rate, and the progress in moving English learners to proficiency. And the state selected indicators are attendance in the career standards benchmark. I wanted to bring to the attention of the board that um, we did have schools that exited um, TSI uh, in from 2019. Um, Edison subgroup economically disadvantaged. They were in TSI in 2019. They have exited Perry students with disabilities and Strong Vincent's English learner subgroup. Um, so they are no longer designated. And here's where we'll see the elementary schools that have been designated TSI. So deal subgroup of two or more races, they're designated TSI for 2023. Joanna Connell, the EL subgroup. McKinley, economically disadvantaged EL students with disabilities. And PB, their EL subgroup was in TSI in 2019 and still remains in um, TSI for 2019. Moving to the middle school, um, you will see we have East and the subgroups. The reason you see so many subgroups is back in 2019, we did have all of these subgroups in TSI. Um, moving forward, sorry, moving to the next column um, for TSI in 2023, two or more races. 
And then um, we did have two groups slip into ATSI, so that additional targeted support, our Black subgroup and our English learner subgroup. Finally, our high school, Erie High, um, which is going to be all of those subgroups listed um, on the slide. And you will see that in 2019, those groups were in um, TSI and the white subgroup remains for this year. But you will see that we slipped on all of the other subgroups, um, all the other subgroups at Erie High into ATSI. So um, they will be designated as additional targeted support improvement from 2023 to 2026. Um, I just wanted to, to bring this, um, I use this document a lot with, with our staff. And um, you can take a look, if Pennsylvania does this and LEAs do this, then schools and communities can do this. This is Pennsylvania's priority statement and we write these in our school plans. But if you look, and I know it's very small, I'm sure that you can see it better um, in board docs. But what I want you to take a look at is the, under the LEA section, you can see the second bullet, support schools and their communities in removing barriers to learning. Customize support systems to meet the local needs. I can't see that one. Context. Thank you. In context of individual schools and implement data informed human capital systems. Allocate resources based on the, the needs of individual schools and their communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. I don't know when it does that, sorry. Um, and, and finally, the, um, the slide that um, is also from PDE. I wanted to bring that, um, my favorite cycle of improvement back in front of the board. Um, this is what Pennsylvania gives us to, to guide us through this process. But it, I thought it was very important to look at the supports and the, the advice that the department does give us. So improvement team support, school improvement dashboard, strategic human capital, research practice partnerships, school improvement advisory council, and of course our cycle of improvement. Um, one thing I did want to mention to the board, if you recall, probably just about this time last year, maybe um, it might have been April or May, we brought a proposal um, to work with our elementary and middle schools, the, the pivot proposal to, to work with our administrators, make them stronger. We're making significant pro progress with that. Um, we are seeing a, a strengthened curriculum implementation uh, across the board. So um, we do feel that in Erie High situation that we are going to need to tap in to some uh, research practice partnerships to help us um, strengthen the systems and structures there and really build on that community. Um, we're currently looking at some options and hope to bring something to the board in the next month or two. And finally, the last slide, again, very small, but um, this is just an example of the timeline <coughs> of the work that we have, um, we're doing internally with um, all of the schools that are designated. And you'll be able to see that better um, on the on board docs. Questions for Teresa? No. 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 It's a, it's a, a, I can just briefly explain what it is. It's just a, on the left side, it's all the tasks that we have to go through in the school improvement planning process. So it's the same thing we've been doing for two years now. Um, it's a little bit deeper in this situation because we do receive support from the IU. I can certainly send this PDF out to the board as soon as I, I get done talking. I can get it out to you so you can see an example of what it looks like. And it, the timeline, the due dates just keep us on, on track as much as possible. Madam President, Teresa, could you just give me an inkling of exactly like something you're going to do at Erie High for one of those groups of kids. So I have an example, a concrete example 
So we we are currently so this right here is what um, what we're working on in the planning process, right? So I I don't know how that will shake out as we do it. Like we complete a root cause analysis, we set goals, we have action steps, we have professional learning. Um, what I can tell you, Rose, is that we worked on these subgroups last year. And obviously what we put into play didn't work very well for that school community. Um, so we are going to have to go back to the drawing board and do a much deeper, honest root cause analysis to see what's going on and how we can best support the school community altogether, staff, students, families, because what, what we're doing is Other questions? It's a lot of data. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lot to take in, right? Yes. So everybody, I think, is maybe just digesting it a little bit. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I, I think as a board, right, you know that that's concerning. I mean, particularly the Erie High information it was good to see some of the schools that came out. But um, I guess, Teresa, I would just ask, now that we've seen those, if you can keep us posted, kind of to Rose's question, what is happening on a regular basis? Mm -hmm. You know, what are we doing? That would be helpful to us. So one of the things Ms. Devlin we would need is um, board representation on our steering committees. So um, it's gonna touch base with you about that probably tomorrow. If, if any board member is interested, we certainly would. What is that steering committee per school, steering committee per subgroup? Per school. Per school. Per school, okay. Per school, okay. So maybe this evening or tomorrow, if you could remind me with an email, and then if I'll get that out to the board, and if you're interested, you can let me know if anyone can serve. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, if that wasn't enough, we'll move on to metal detectors now. Uh, Brian and Neil. Yes, at last, last meeting, we proposed the, the concept of installing or putting metal detectors at all our elementary schools. Um, and last month, we've done a, a little more work on that. Jill has a proposal to review with you. And we've also had uh, deeper discussions with both the Erie Education Association and our administrators about it. And they, they all do support uh, this move to, to put the metal detectors in. They agree that if we do it, we want to make it um, as intrusive, the least intrusive as possible. Uh, so we would want to dial back the, the settings to the lowest so that we have kids moving through uh, quicker and don't have to search in those bags. So you want to talk to the proposal? Yep. Uh, so we surveyed all of the administrators and asked them what their morning routines were. And based on that, they were able to tell me a, a total number of metal detectors that are needed per building. All together, the, uh, all 10 buildings, uh, they're requesting 35 metal detectors. Uh, 35 metal detectors with the stand at the bottom, hooking them up into the, the cloud system that we have. The total price tag for all 35 is $625,206. I have confirmed with Cleveland Metro that they do have metal detectors in every single one of their schools at every single level. And they've actually been doing it for 10 years. Um, Officer, um, Mr. Parker has been in contact with them and is actually planning a day where he can spend in Cleveland to watch how they work their system. They've been doing it for 10 years and clearly they're, they're doing something correctly. And uh, he's gonna plan on going to an elementary, a middle, as well as a high school just to kind of see their process. Is that on an agenda? Is that on the agenda for approval? It is not because we wanted to discuss it with you okay. here tonight. If there are, I guess, no objections at this point, I would like to have it added to the agenda for next week for approval. Let's see where everyone is on this. Do we feel comfortable moving it forward to the agenda? Do we have more questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, thumbs up. Great. Thanks, Jay. That's very effective. <laughs> oh, and so did Lori. Okay. So we've got a couple of thumbs up. Some of your questions, please. When you say you're going to dial them down, 
which would be such that, for example, we would be able to uh, pick up a, a gun, but not, but not a knife? Or, or... So the default setting on these are to pick up weapons of mass casualty. So a gun, yes, that gets okay. picked up. A knife at to a certain point will get picked up. A smaller knife that probably has a blade, and, I, and I'm not... Don't quote me on this, but imagine you have a blade that's about three inches long that may not get picked up. But a machete would. But a machete is most certainly getting picked up. The uh, intent behind this is that the students can go through faster. Um, what we found at the settings that they're currently at up at Erie High, which is the most restrictive, is that a cell phone will set it off. And the reason that a cell phone will set it off is because there's a metal spline in the cell phone. And the devices see it and they think that it's a knife versus it's just somebody's cell phone. Questions? Any other questions, comments, Mr. Shreve? My biggest concern is how is it going to how is it going to be maintained at the schools? Because I visited majority of the schools and it seems like there's not a good system in place who's who's uh who's in charge of like when people walk in there's times I walk into school and they tell me, oh, put your stuff down and walk through and nobody's there to check and something's still going off. Like, I seem, it feels like there's not currently in our schools, there's not a good system in place in all the schools <laughs> that do have those uh, uh, metal detectors. And that's a concern just to, you know, to go forward with it. That's my concern. So you're saying where we already have them, you don't see them being monitored. And so we wonder how they'll be monitored in the elementary. Because uh, I can I can say specific schools. Uh, for example, uh, I went to Erie High. Uh, uh, you know, I buzzed in. They're like, oh, come in. And I usually didn't say, hey, my name is Zachary. I'm a school board. I walked in. Actually, there was nobody there. I just walked right through, right into the office. So that's one. Uh, went to... Uh, Withdrawal, withdrawal Wilson. The secretary, she did, uh, I mean, through the class, she like put everything down. But at the same time, is she supposed to be doing her job or who's who's assigned? Nobody's assigned to actually monitor these things. Uh, then, and I actually went to a, another basketball game at Erie High. Uh, I walked right in. Like, nobody was there to monitor it. Like, there was like five police officers that they were in the gym. So there, there's something that needs to be done right now. Right, what answer? I guess we take a look at those specific issues and follow up. There should be officers at the, at the doors um, checking those. One thing I do want to remind the board is that we did, uh, two months ago, we did approve getting security officers in. Those officers are going to start, this should be next week, Neil, is that correct? Yes. So we'll have a, a number of security officers there to help with the, the morning uh, with the students coming in, and then they'll, they'll be there half a day to help with visitors as well. Very high. We're going to have somebody up there full time, which will also assist with uh, taking up security. Um, for the elementary, the, the reason why we want to turn back the, the uh, setting is because that means that there will be less, many, many less students needing bags which visitors so that we'll be able to to quickly get all the students through and have a student step aside that maybe be searched and, and make sure we get an administrator or an officer there to help them. Ms. Sheridan? Um, I just want to concur with Mr. Sharif that I did go to Erie High and I walked right in. There was nobody there to want me or put me through and then I did my business, came back out there was nobody. I thought, well, maybe somebody's on break or they need something. But I did report it to you. Sadly, I will also concur that I had the same experience at Erie High. Um, I, I guess the question is during the during arrival, I think it's monitored, right? I mean, we know that. But then during the day, to Mr. Sharif's point, I mean, so we've gotten the kids through, right? But as we have visitors, there should be somebody there at least to know if it goes off. Am I right? Okay. Supposed to be what's happening. Okay, so other questions or comments? I we have the two thumbs up. Are we all okay moving this forward on the agenda? Anyone? Yes, John. Just, just Mr. Parker, 
No, it won't. I think that the point of the visit is to kind of walk away with best practices, um, just to make sure that our systems are working appropriately. Is that a noise and cry? Is the base link that buzzed in and pushed the door or, or unbuzzable? Yeah, I, I had the same experience. I was buzzed in, but there was no one to monitor the metal detector. And then when I went to the office, you know, I, I signed in. It was missing. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah. Too, but at least they were aware. I knew somebody was coming. Yeah. OK, so it sounds like, Brian, Neil, you have enough to move this forward. OK, thank you. Moving on then to item 6, the 23-24 charter enrollment budget. I'll just keep going for the rest Great. of the agenda, by the way. Um, so the good news about being removed from financial watch is that we were removed from financial watch. Uh, however, being removed from financial watch triggered us to do one additional step. So the financial improvement plan stated that we needed to work towards uh, uh, not increasing our charter enrollment by 30 students annually every year. It was set in stone. So if somebody requested a charter cap increase, we couldn't say, well, you can get 20 and you can get 20 because that would be more than what we would be allowed to do for the financial improvement plan. However, now that we're at a financial watch, um, it triggers the rest of the uh, policy. And so just to remind everybody, just so that we knew what we were looking at, the policy is at your seat uh, behind the table with the numbers. And so this, this evening, we're here to talk about uh, a charter enrollment cap budget assumption. Um, and Jenny, feel free to chime in on any policy things if you feel like you need to. Uh, the, the chart in front of you shows what our total charter expenditures have been for the last five years, as well as where we believe this year's estimate is going to end. Um, for reference, we budgeted about $34 million, just a little bit more than $34 million for our total charter tuition. So I'm estimating that will be about half a million dollars below. Um, when you do the comparison every year, year on and year end, um, our overall charter tuition total bill has increased on average 5.4% annually for the course of these five years. Uh, and then obviously underneath that, you can see that it's we've got our ADMs. So that's the average daily membership. Uh, that's the, it's different than a head count. So that's the, how many days, how many kids were enrolled at a charter school by regular ed to, uh, and special ed. Uh, and then again, there's the, the estimate there. Um, so at, at this point, we are, um, the reason that we were gonna, we have this conversation is because presently there are two of the brick and mortar charter schools that have asked for an increase in their enrollment cap. Um, and we will have to address that further down the line. To complicate this even more, um, with Erie Rise slated to close on June 30th, and with the board adopting the resolution that states that any student who were to transfer from Rise to one of the other brick and mortars wouldn't count towards that enrollment cap, it's kind of a moving target as we don't necessarily know how many of those students will A, choose to enroll at a charter school and get entry through their lottery system, or B, just come back to us or C, opt to go to a cyber term. I feel like that was clear as mud. I'm sorry. I just want to understand. So we, we, you have to give us this budget assumption so that when you present the budget to us next month, we know that you did some work to figure out what number to plug in under the charter line item. Is that Correct. The policy has us present this in March so that we can start thinking about uh, whether or not you want to consider raising charter caps. Um, okay. So we, we're coming to you tonight to give you our best estimate, knowing that with the rise closing, we're not sure exactly what's going to happen. So our recommendation is that we want to hold off on any decisions regarding charter caps until we have a better understanding of how the closure is going to affect our numbers and 
budget next year. Questions for Mr. Polito, Mr. Brockman, on this item? Mr. So, Nichols, I know you have one. The Sorry. kids. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry, we'll start with Summer. Are we hearing from Rice if there's been a file on the field or something? I would imagine that was complicated, or we're going to talk about that in the oh, Okay. Okay. Right, that question. Okay. You're up to Sheridan. Okay. Please. So the kids that we said could go to charter schools from Erie Rise won't be counted in with them asking us for additional kids. Correct. That's right. Correct. Okay. So the numbers that you presented us, that those total, the total amounts, would they decrease with the closing of the Erie Rise? Like with the with the amount that the charter schools would receive, would that decrease since Erie Rise is closing? That that's our concern. We don't know okay. what's going to happen with the total charter enrollment. If it's going to decrease, resulting in a decrease in the budget. Okay. We we just don't know if they're going to shift to other schools if they're going to come back to us on how that will impact. And we don't want to move ahead and assume that we're going to see a reduction in charter students this year and approve caps and then go over budget next year. Okay. Right. So and so, sorry, Zach, how how much time are we trying to give on this? Like till the end until they completely close or I think by the end of this um, school year, we'll have a much better idea. We are, um, and the step one actually recommended it, we're, we're moving ahead to have an enrollment night for the Erie Rise families in March, we're gonna continue to, to try to work with them between now and the end of the school year to get them um, enrolled in either our school or one of their charter schools so that they have a better understanding of where we're going to be next year and we also ensure that those students are enrolled in their school. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Shree. Are we are we getting students now from the Rise? And are we tracking up students? Yes. In the last month, we've had uh, about eleven students return back. Okay. Yes, Mr. Shree. Are any? Uh, what are the two charter schools again that we're looking at that they can go to? Uh, there the three charter schools okay. that they can go to would be Percy's House. Robert Benjamin Wiley and Montessori. Okay, now the question it's not a charter school. What are some of those students decide to go to the Eagle? The Eagle's Nest? That would be a program that or is run by uh, I, 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 I said it's not a charter school. And, and so that. they would have they would have to enroll with us and then they would have to go through the application process to get into the Eagle's Nest. What grades is Eagle's Nest offering now? I've lost it's uh, sixth, seventh, eighth, and kindergarten. Yeah. Um, and we, had, as we discussed last year, they want to expand it. So we do have the, uh, the contract on this year, this month's agenda for next year, which would include first grade this month. That's on this month's agenda. Yes. Okay. There's currently a placeholder. If I just spoke with Dr. Jackson this evening. Contract will be placed on the agenda as well. Other questions on this item? What do you need from us here? I guess you, you're just letting us know it's going to be a while, or do we have to formally waive something? Great. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Item seven: furniture. Okay. Uh, so this year, uh, when the budget was created, we created a line item for furniture replacement. Um, based on what we were doing at Erie High, it being the, the, the biggest project that we have, we spent a, a very large amount of money making that building look very good. And all it really did was exaggerate how poorly the furniture looked. Um, so the team over at Erie High put together a furniture committee. And after listening to their needs and working with the vendor, uh, there is a proposal on the agenda to uh, furnish what is finished on the north side with all new classroom furniture. So that would include student desks, student chairs, a teacher desk, and a teacher chair. The total price tag for this is 
$44,000. When Mr. Polito and I built out this item line last year for the budget, um, we did not necessarily anticipate what the overall cost would be to outfit a room. I think that we used old numbers. Uh, the going rate to furnish a classroom is anywhere between seven and eleven thousand dollars per room, based on the furniture that you that you get. Um, this proposal, the per classroom cost is about ninety five hundred, so we're right in the middle. Uh, we are not buying the top shelf furniture. We're also not getting the furniture that is going to break in five years. Uh, in speaking with the vendor, this furniture does have a shelf life of anywhere between fifteen and twenty years. The intent would be that we would continue this furniture replacement cycle in the budget for as many years, well, just in perpetuity, basically, at this point. And we would work our way through the school district, replacing furniture along the way so that we don't get to a point where it's, hey, we have to dump a lot of money to buy new furniture. We'll just have this in a regular cycle. We've been working very hard over the last couple of years to fill in cycles into the budget. For example, the first one was the curriculum cycle uh, to have that line item there so that we can continually refresh things and we don't get to a, a point where uh, we budget it for a couple of years and then we stop and then 25 years later we, we realize we don't have any books that are up to date and we have to spend the time and money. So this is a continuation of that. It's, it's financially is to fill that in. As Mr. Brock indicated, we, we feel that this this line item at half a million dollars will be enough to get that cycle going and ensure that over time we'll always have money available to re replace the furniture as it as it works out. Um, this is just for Erie High? Correct. What about the Edison project and the furniture? So the Edison project and the furniture we will include the purchase of new furniture for Edison as part of the bigger project. I'm working with the architects now to uh, kind of create that catalog of what the furniture could possibly look like in the building. I had an initial meeting with the architects um, and the, the kind of feel after leaving that meeting is that we want to standardize what's in the rooms. And then there are additional places where we can have um, different type of furniture uh, but we want to we want to standardize the classrooms as much as we can so that each of the rooms are the same and then maybe in the stem lab we can have some different types of furniture uh, uh, they were in the middle of having the conversation to see if we should put this as its own prime furniture prime for the contract or we could get it cheaper by going direct to a co-stars vendor uh, which the, the purchase that uh, we're talking about tonight is a vendor who is on CoStar, so it's on state contract. We know that we're going to get the lowest possible price that's approved by the state. So the architects are doing that analysis right now. Other furniture questions? Later topic than our others this evening. If there are no objections, I would also request adding this to the agenda for next week. Everybody okay with that? One more thumbs up, but I'm assuming they're okay with it. Okay, we'll move on then to the IT position, item eight. So in doing the uh, work now that we're doing, preparing for the budget for next year, part of that uh, cycle means trying to estimate where we're gonna finish this year. Uh, so as I work with each individual department and I look at the individual lines, I start to have these conversations with the, the individuals who are in charge. And one of the things that um, I noticed is that our IT department has a lot of overtime hours. And when I discuss the reasons behind it with the two supervisors, there is a very large amount of time that is spent with our one-to-one -one devices. Bringing in broken devices, cleaning them, testing them, putting them back together, and getting them back into circulation. Um, in talking with the two supervisors that we have, uh, it, they would be fine with us bringing on another employee who would be a lower level technician whose sole responsibility would be to work on these devices. Um, to ensure that this is budget neutral, what will happen is that the overtime line 
for that department will be decreased by the same amount of money that it will cost to bring on this employee. Um, at this point, I believe that they have done interviews and I believe they have somebody in mind that they would like to bring into this position. Questions for Mr. Brockman on that? I guess I would just, I trust, right? We approve a lot and I, I'm just, as long as you tell us we have the money, I feel like we have the money and you wouldn't bring it to us if we didn't, but I still feel, you know, we're in that mode of spending money, which is fantastic. We haven't done it, but we have the money. Yeah. Yes, for all for these things. Yeah. Okay. This, this is just a continuation of trying to move beyond the uh, crisis operation triage approach to, to what we're doing in the labor markets. One thing I do want to remind the board is that they, in addition to the overtime we did, um, at the end of this year, eliminate the print shop, which will also create additional funding to support this position. So you are okay with them seeking out somebody to, for this job? Yes, I was. I This was something that after them talking to me and I'm talk, me talking to them about where the needs are and how we can best do this, it, it made sense to at least go ahead, let's get some interviews done and see if there is a qualified candidate that was out there. Other comments on this one, questions? Okay. We'll finally be done with Mr. Brockman and it looks like item nine is the newsletter. I think Ms. Irwin is on. Hi, Erica. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Yep. And before <laughs> Erica gets started, I just want to remind the board that as part of our goals for this coming year, you did ask us to find ways to better communicate some of the good stories that are happening here in the district, and there's a lot of them, uh, with, with our families and the uh, community as a whole. So Eric and I, actually Eric has been really working hard on this, and I think we have some pretty good ideas on how to get this information out to not only our uh, school-age families, but everybody in the community that, that Thank you, Mr. Polito. And I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person with you tonight, but I'm happy to talk about uh, this other potential avenue of communication, which is a citywide newsletter that would feature district news and um, more lighthearted features about our students, our families, and the wonderful things that are happening in our schools every day. Other school districts do this. Um, you, I'm sure, have also seen uh, these kind of newsletters come to you from your favorite nonprofit organizations, other local businesses. Um, at your seat, uh, you should have a very rough uh, mock-up of what something like this uh, newsletter could look like. Um, again, the idea is that it would be a mix of, of news and features to really highlight uh, the positive things that are happening in our district every day. Right now, we rely on um, a lot of other channels to do exactly that, including uh, TV, newspaper, but to be honest, we are at their mercy um, in terms of what they're able to cover, when they're able to cover it, and what kind of coverage they're able to provide. We also use uh, our social media and leverage our website. Uh, and again, that depends on visitors coming in. And we've done a lot to engage and bring those visitors in. The engagement and numbers we saw uh, recently um, through Black History Month and also our celebration of Career and Technical Education Month are some of the highest we've seen. So we are reaching uh, our families, our students, but we need to do more, and one way to do that would be through this citywide newsletter that goes beyond our families, and what we're proposing is into the uh, every home and every business within city limits. Um, so also at your seat, you should have a, uh, a paper outlining three different options for consideration. Um, depending on both frequency and cost. Um, options could include a quarterly, quarterly 
newsletter that is uh, delivered four times a year to uh, all of our, our homes and businesses. We're talking about nearly uh, 51,000 uh, properties uh, at a cost of uh, four times a year, about $74,700. And twenty dollars. You'll see on that sheet the two other options are a, a bi-monthly option during the school year and a monthly option during the school year. I came up with those three options because they just make the most sense to me. But they're certainly not uh, the only options we can consider. And so, depending on the frequency, those the the cost uh, associated would range from that seventy four thousand. Um, up to about 187,000. So I'll, I'll pause there and take any questions you have or thoughts just about number one, the the newsletter idea to begin with. Um, the as I said, the mock um, the mock newsletter that you have, you'll you'll see that mix of news and features. Something like that could be ready to go for May. Um, so I'll stop there and ask if you have any questions about the newsletter or any of the costs associated with it. Ms. Jay Berman raised Hold on one second, Ms. Cooley. I'm just laughing at the language. Oh, she's laughing at the Latin because of the mock-up. Okay, got it. Um, so we had a hand up there, Mr. Brenneman. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I don't have any questions. I just want to say that I think it's a great idea. We get, I think we all have stories and we've seen where, you know, people have questions or, old myths and beliefs about the school district and how it is. And, you know, maybe they have a step foot in the school building in a year or 10, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And it's a very different environment. And I think that uh, we, we do owe it to our children and our educators and professionals to, to, hi to highlight and celebrate what's going on and, and not to be stuck with the news cycle. Cause you know, Erica didn't expound too much on it, but you know, it's if they feel it's worthy to run the story, how much of it are they going to let us run? And then also, who is the audience? And, you know, the benefit of a newsletter going to every household, you know, I, I think that's great. Personally, this is just me. I, if I get it every month, I think that I think monthly is great because there's obviously every month there's something great. Right. My two concerns with monthly mm -hmm. is that, you know. A, is that a, I know it can be a lot for staff to have to put together a newsletter, especially monthly, but also for, um, you know, if I get something once a month in the mail, I'm, I'm going to be perfectly honest. And I know I'm just in, in equals one. I'm not going to read it every single month. If I get it like once a quarter or something like that, I'm, I'm definitely going to find the material useful. So just by my own personal preference, I would be more, you know, geared towards the the shorter, uh, the the fewer amount, at least just to get started, see how it goes. But I'm fully supportive of, of any frequency when it comes to this. Ms. Irwin, who do we envision um, creating this? Would that be the students or would that be a staff member? Oh, that's oh, me. I, I was just curious because <laughs> that's I, me. But but you you bring up a great point. Um, I think we can absolutely make space, um, regular space for student submissions, whether that be artwork, whether that be content. Um, I I think we should absolutely in some way uh, find a way to showcase student contributions in in every issue in some way. Okay, thanks for answering that. Who else has questions yeah. for Erica? Yeah, Mr. Nichols. He's a more eager reader than Mr. Brenneman. I like the idea of the monthly. I just think that would have more impact by getting it out every month during the school year that people would, would pay more attention to it. It could be shorter, I guess, each month. But uh, something that comes quarterly or something like that, I don't see that generating the interest of something that comes out monthly, particularly if there is a student component to it. And I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Mr. Harkins? About bi-monthly as a rollout, see how it goes, and then we just step it up to monthly, which is uh, obviously a good piece of executive monthly, but keeps it out of bi-monthly might be the, I guess I'm advocating that uh, strongly. I'm just reacting to what Jay had in his own stuff. Suggesting bi monthly as a rollout. 
Mr. Sharif, did you have something? Great idea to highlight exactly what's happening in the schools and get more kids, uh, more students involved. In so. Eric, I have a, I have a few questions. I know I, I am, would. I, and I'm yeah. sorry. I just want to make sure I was having difficulty hearing Mr. Harkins and Mr. Shreve. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any question or anything that I need to address. Mr. Harkins said maybe bi-monthly would be the way to start, and Mr. Sharif just said this is a great idea. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a few questions. First, do you have the time? I mean, do you feel that you have the sufficient time to take on? I just think this is a huge project, and I want to gut check that with you. No, I appreciate that, and I, I do think I have the time. Um, I think, you know, um, I think most of you know before coming here that uh, deadlines through uh, the daily newspaper were, were my life. So uh, I do think this is something I can take on. Um, for me, um, for a, a variety of, of reasons, um, many of them uh, touched on by Mr. Brenneman, I think um, maybe the quarterly or bi-monthly makes sense, both from an outpoint, uh, output standpoint and a strength of content standpoint. But open to open to discuss that further. Mr. Harkins mentioned that maybe we could do bi-monthly and then see how it was received. Now, I had a question, how would we track readership? Is there a way to do that? So we knew whether it was just going right into the circular file or people were reading it. Could we track that somehow? Sure, I'm I'm positive there is a way to do that. We're working with um, uh, these, the quotes that you have in front of you are from printing concepts. Um, I can have a uh, I, I can have a discussion with them about how their many clients um, do that. Um, but we can also track through um, through other ways. I can envision, you know, a you know in uh, QR codes or other incentives to respond and let us know. Um, so I, I think there there would be a way to track it and kind of decide if we're on the right track. Fiscally. My pastor did something at church and it really, she put just a small line in the announcement. <laughs> and it was like, um, congratulations, you won this month. And she had a little, and all these bulletins went out, nobody, you know, and she said, that let me know you're reading. And one person said, is this what this, this means? It says, yeah, it says, you're a winner. See the pastor. <laughs> but, you know, it was like two months have went by and no one said anything. And then she said, is anyone reading the bulletins? Right. And they said, people stood up, want to read the announcement. She said, no, 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 sit down. And it was yeah. that whole lot. So maybe somewhere in the newsletter, you can put something that says you want, you want a dinner or you want a prize. That way, you know, they're reading. Well, and you know, it, it, it's also on me to make sure the content is engaging and interesting to um, the entire audience. Our audience should be more than just students and their families. The idea here is to reach the taxpayers, people who might not otherwise have a vested interest in the school district and show them why they should um, and highlight stories um, that that prove that. So hopefully, if I'm doing my job right, um, they're, you know, they're not just throwing it away. They're participating. Um, they're drawn in by the cover and by the news, other news on the inside. Um, and and hopefully, hopefully that helps spread the word. Erica, my last question. Did you get a couple of bits on this? I heard you say printing concepts. I just wondered if, if that's because you work with them often or if there were a couple of bits that you went to on this. I, I work with printing concepts really often, and so I did just reach out to them uh, just to get the ball rolling preliminarily here. Um, my experience has been super positive, um, and particularly um, starting a new product, I, I thought uh, reaching out to someone that we have an established relationship and has proven uh, the quality of their work to us throughout the um, numerous projects. Printing Concepts is the company that is we've worked with most recently in doing our student information guide every year. So um and they always deliver and they do do a good job. Okay. Okay. 
other questions for Erica? It's not a comment. It's just a, uh, it's not a question. It's just a comment. When you do something bi-monthly, um, I've had experiences with some magazines coming and by the time they came to me, certain announcements were outdated. No so question. Sure the content is relevant and timely. Right. I, th I think we would absolutely have to be cognizant of that. And I don't see this as a vehicle for delivering breaking news at all, um, you know, but more uh, kind of uh, in depth or, again, news targeted not just to families and students, but um, more in depth news like you'll see um, in the mock up. I wrote about updates on our CTE program and um, our construction projects. These are things that that people beyond um, our, our buildings can be interested in and are not tied to any particular um, date or time. But that's a great point. Thank you. So I heard some comments about quarterly and bi-monthly. You know, the difference between those two is less than 20,000. I guess I would say maybe we leave it to Erica. She's the expert. She, you know, she lived in the life of deadlines. So maybe we let you, if the board is okay with that, unless someone feels really strongly, maybe we let you, Erica, decide how you want to move forward between those two options. I don't think anyone really feels that maybe monthly is the way to start, but the bi-monthly or the quarterly, perhaps. Can everybody be okay with that? Or you could have monthly that would be like October, November, February, March, or April. You know, there are breaks in the school year where you, because it is important that what's in there is contemporary, not stale. So you heard our comments, Erica, and maybe we'll just leave it to you to come back to us with what you decide, if that's okay with everyone else. Thank you so much for this work. I think it's a fantastic idea, long overdue. So thank you so much. I appreciate the support. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so item 10 on our agenda is review of the draft uh, meeting agenda for next week. If everyone had a moment to review that, just take a moment and let's see if anyone has any questions about the agenda. I have a couple, so maybe I'll ask while I'm waiting. That's okay. Natalie, I just wondered about the crossing guard item on uh, 6.30. Is that just regular hiring now of crossing guards now that we're doing that? Yeah, so we need to um, onboard and move the crossing guards that work um, for the city as well as um, hire additional. And there are also some of our employees that are serving as crossing guards. <clears throat> Thanks. How many are we up to? I would just like to say I've heard from people driving around who say, I saw a crossing guard in a place I never saw one before, which was really nice to hear. Um, and then one other question I have for you, Teresa, under travel 6.02, I see Mr. Nielsen is going to the college counselors forum. When educators go to conferences like that, is there an expectation that they present back what they learned or they're sharing it with their colleagues? I just know with the focus we have on counseling, curious when information is brought back, if it's shared out. Yes, depending on what the conference or the visit is, yes, there is a section on the travel requests that they propose before the travel approval is uh, processed. Those were mine. Who else has questions? Okay. Then I think we're on to item 11. Any other matter? I believe Mr. Nichols, you had a few things? Yes, I do, Madam President. Uh, first, and this is really a bit lucky on the timing here after our success last night, is uh, I wanted to get the sense of the board if there's interest in expanding the athletic budget, which I knew nothing about until uh, Brian and Neil responded to me. And here's the good news about it. In 2022, the budget was a million six, so it's not you know, relative, it's less than 1% of the overall budget. Uh, and my other suspicion was this has probably been squeezed in recent years because of other more pressing areas. And uh, 
what I've got is uh, the budget 2017 through 2022. And uh, during that time, it only went up 1% a year. Now the salaries went up three, but you know, our equipment went down from 350,000 to 270,000. So, you know, we have not been able to spend money there. I think it's a relatively small part of the budget and I would like to see a, a dynamic increase in this. And my rationale for it is just what's happened in the last few weeks. You know, I go to the, Gwen and I are big basketball fans. We go to the basketball games and what's good about our basketball teams, uh, boys and girls, is they're both competitive and, and uh, they've done quite well. Uh, you know, we have difficulties with our football team, which we're hoping that the kids from East will hold on to them and they'll get that going again. But basketball, we've been competitive. But in the course of this year, we played prep twice and they beat us both times. And I think they were laying off a little bit. They could have uh, beat us by a larger score. And we played McDowell and uh, we were more competitive with McDowell, but they beat us twice. So with the with the big schools in the area, we were all in four. So there we are. But now we've got a Cinderella team. Because then we go to the District 10 playoffs, which I'm too stupid to figure out, so I missed the game. I assume the playoffs were between Prep and uh, McDowell, but Prep's in the 5A, we're 6A. So we automatically go in no matter what. So whether we we're horrible or whatever, we're going to always be in this playoff. So we have this playoff game, which I, of course, miss. And we eke out a victory by two points. So we moved on. Now, a year, a year ago, we lost the same game by like two points. I mean, we're very competitive there. So then we played. So then we have uh, this next playoff game, which was yesterday. Now, we had the home field advantage because we had beaten Alder Deese in the, which is from Pittsburgh, uh, in December. But, you know, our... Uh, area isn't big enough and it's in disarray with the construction. So it was held at prep. So that's kind of a disadvantage to a basketball team not to play on their home court. They had to play uh, at a neutral court. It's a very nice court there, but uh, it's, it's not their normal court. And this game was better than the one I missed because at the end of the first quarter, they had twice as many points as we did. And uh, they had not lost a game in the state of Pennsylvania other than to us. So, you know, they were out to get us. And they were bigger than we are, but our team's scrappy. And uh, we came back in the last couple minutes and took the lead. And this is after being down by, you know, over 10 points at, at the half. It was just a great game to watch. And I've got a tape of it, which I really think we should play at the meeting next week. To, so I can show you that this is something that some of the citizens get excited about. Uh, and uh, we may have better tapes than the one I have. I was sitting in the Alderdees section by mistake. And <laughs> they were getting up and yelling at the refs because we were, the calls were coming our way. So they blocked my view somewhat, but I really want you to see this because of the huge degree of enthusiasm that was uh, shown. Uh, my other thought was I had read in the, in the uh, teacher's contract that coaches, if we go to playoffs, there's uh, playoffs that they get paid an extra day, you know, for each game. And I thought, boy, that's kind of, Poultry, because you know, you know, if we're moving through, we're going to get publicity. It's it's good for the district. And uh, our new athletic director was of the same mind, and she'd already put in a guideline where she talked to some of our competitors around here and came up with some other uh, additions. But they're still modest. A uh, hundred dollars the head coach and assistant coaches $70. I honestly think we can increase that by a factor of 10 or 20. I think this is really important to the district. If you get the newspaper, and I still do, uh, when, when Erie beat McDowell, they had this gorgeous color picture of the coach and the team just, you know, uh, celebrating. Uh, and then when our 
girls lost to uh, Mattel. They had a nice picture of the Mattel team celebrating. That's a nice thing to have in the newspaper. That's not somebody getting shot or something like that. It's, it's very positive. And the other thing, I think there's an academic component to the athletic uh, department because we have a lot of kids, for example, on the football team, and they have certain grades they've got to maintain to stay on the team. It, it was featured in the newspaper some months ago, uh, what was required for that. I think we can increase our graduation rate by uh, increasing our athletic uh, budget. When, when we combined the schools, the idea was to save money and also to come up with a more competitive team. But it also means fewer kids could participate. You know, we need money for the intramurals. I don't know how much we have for that, but we need to encourage uh, the athletic end. And so that's why I'm asking if there's interest in the board in this and uh, so we can work on a proposal for this. Uh, to present at next month's meeting. So that's, I'm just asking if there's an interest in this. Our increase from 2017 to 2022 is 1% a year. And of course it was cut when they pulled the schools together, I think primarily because of cut in travel expenditures. But I just think it's an area which fortunately is not a huge part of the budget where additional money can really help us and help, our, help build our image. Let's stop on that one first, Summer. Yeah. Thanks for all your hard work. And I think Mr. Polito has some comments on that. Um, yes, just uh, before the board has a discussion about that, I want to clarify a few things. Uh, the 2017 was the first year after the consolidation. Uh, we did see a drop. I'm, I'm just looking at salaries right now um, in student activities, which is mostly athletics. Before the reconfiguration, our Salaries in that area were $934,000. The year after the reconfiguration, they were $470,000. Uh, this year, uh, we're estimating that it's going to be about $586,000. And next year, um, or I'm sorry, this year we're estimated about $777,000. And, and why it's grown over the last couple of years is because uh, about two years ago, the board did approve the uh, full-time athletic director and an assistant athletic director, and they were both charged with building out these programs, the athletic director at the secondary level and the assistant building those feeder programs at the elementary and middle school. So that has grown naturally as, as they've been doing their job at uh, building those programs out. It's going to continue to grow naturally as they do this over the next couple of years. So I do want to remind the board that you know, that is a focus of ours. And um, I, I know Dale is scheduled to be here next month. I think maybe it would be good to hear her perspective on what she's planning on doing before the board makes any decisions on budget. Um, certainly, I'm not going to say no to any increase in the budget, but I want to be thoughtful about it. Um, just because you put an increase in there, I can't commit to building something out within one year because we just don't have the capacity to do that right now. Thanks, Brian, for that context. Other comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Argus? I think in reaction to what Sumner's saying and what the superintendent said, I'm just we went through a period maybe of 20 years of decline, and certainly in the last dozen years more acutely when funds weren't there and things had to be cut and went unfilled. And so it was nickel and dime, we maybe quartered and half dollar to death over and over. And now that we're coming out of the darkness, I especially am glad to hear Sumner's enthusiasm. And what, what I would like our approach to be is to share his enthusiasm and as specific uh, concrete uh, choices are presented to us to make an improvement to get us back in a better uh, level of athletic uh, programs. That we have specific, we, re, we, we accept and, and, and react to specifics, but to generally throw a sum of money to increase the category of athletics just seems a little reckless. I don't, I'm not accusing you of that, Summer, but I just mean I think now that we can afford more and want to, we should just welcome and, and invite uh, specific uh, targets of uh, areas of improvement and build. Uh, and, and then if we're in support of that, as I am, and I think many of us are, that we just, you know, build back uh, that way rather than look at the total 
athletic budget and try to increase that just for the sake of increasing it. I, I hope I'm not sounding critical. I'm just saying that I think we should be more focused on specific. Let's do this here. Let's do this here. Yeah, and to be be specific on that, John, um, we have this athletic guideline for postseason competition, which would give a head coach a hundred dollars to get to one step, and then if they get to the state, it's two hundred. I think those amounts should be 10, 20 times higher than that. It's not that much money. How often do you win the state champion? The last one we won wasn't that strong, Vincent. I mean, it wouldn't be much money, but I think when we have success, like our basketball program has, I think these coaches should be rewarded and it should go all the way down to the middle school level where they're starting to develop the talent uh, just to encourage you know, better performances. And I don't think that would be much money at all, but that's a specific increase. But I, I also think we need a general increase to be handled by, you know, bit budgeted successfully. When our when our supplies and equipment goes from 350,000 in 2017 to 271,000 in 2022, you know, we're wearing out some stuff that we, we should replace. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Do you have something, Glenn? Um, I, my question was, he said, increasing the athletic budget, and what is that including? I'm not just about personnel being paid. They get paid to coach. I see the additional funding. Um, we need to look at if they're taking trips, are they going on a, on a coach or Anderson? Um, no more yellow buses. Um, is the equipment being provided for all athletics? Um, that's what we need to look like. I just keep hearing you talk about the personnel. I, if we're going to increase it, we got to make sure that we're increasing it to make sure the students are pr provided for and taken care of. I agree with that. Yeah. Thanks. Enrich Thanks. the program. Yeah. Jay, I see your hands up. Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, Mr. Nichols, for, you know, bringing up again, like there's certain things that I'm not keen on that you are and everybody's sort of got their own areas of interest. So I do appreciate that, especially because I do have, you know, um, next fall, I'm going to have three kids in our district, you know, going to school, two in elementary and one in middle school. And, and um, you know, I, one of the things that I've, I've always thought would be great for us to consider. And um, as we are focusing as a district on social emotional skill building, et cetera, is less of a focus or just not an entirety of focus of athletics on championships and uh, competition, but also more on the the overall health and well-being and the benefits that come from from uh, sports participation and broadening that. And that's always been like a lingering question that I've had. I wanted to ask the new um, director. I just had it and didn't want to you know add too much to her plate. But you know, I guess when it comes to this subject, I you know with this with the staff thing like that, as far as like you know an, an extra day for a playoff or something, I really don't have any issue with that at all but really when i think about sports i think you know we we got to sort of like yes the competitions winning winning them are, are great but that leaves out a ton of students and it also reinforces the only way that sports helps you is if you're able to get a scholarship and then go on to play professional sports so i i, I would just like if, if this could if conversation expands which i hope it does that it in, incorporates includes those types of perspectives. Thanks, Jay. Other comments? I like what Sonia said about how it fits in with the development of the total student and how it helps keep kids, some kids in school. And uh, it's just part of the role of education of, a, of an individual. So all of that is welcome to hear because we just could, we had to say no to a lot of things over a long period of time. I'm just saying, I think we need to have deliberate, focused, responsible, targeted instances to support rather than an overall, here's a lot of money to do some wonderful things with it, somebody. But I don't want anything I'm saying to sound critical of what someone's ad advocating is the way to approach it, how we can make it real. Mr. Brockman, do you have something to say? I I just want to make the board aware, and this will be part, I think, of next month's presentation from uh, uh, Ms. Mills, that 
she did send out a sports interest survey to the students in the middle schools and I believe the high school, she's in the next room over. So if I'm misspeaking, she'll come right through the door and tell me that I'm misspeaking. So we do have a list from the students' <laughs> perspectives of what sports they would like us to have. So we'll make sure that that would be part of the presentation that is given, much to your point, Mr. Harkins, that uh, we want to make sure that if we are going to start offering something that is new, that it is targeted, and it is based on the interests of the students. Thank you. I wonder, I wonder, Dale, could you come out? Sorry. Sorry. We're talking about you like you're not here. That's okay. Um, so I guess my question is this, you know, I think Mr. Nichols, it's great the way you brought this up today because it allowed us all to give input and Brian gave us some context. Would you be able, like Dr. Kanaki did, you know, in a perfect world, what would your athletic budget look like? I mean, not going nutsy nuts, but what what are the things you think you need so that you could start you could start helping us build a budget that you know would make Mr. Harkins and the thing feel better like it's based on you know real things and to Mr. Polito's point it's actually based on the realities of what we can do over a short period of time so is that something that Dale could do is is work on a proposal for yes, us I, I think that as we're going and, and moving forward with just inventory like and figure out what has been purchased and making a plan and using that uniform cycle and equipment cycle, what we're hearing, that's what we're trying to build because that's where we need to go to. We just don't want to buy uniforms just to buy uniforms, but it's not necessary, but we need to learn to cycle those and use those the right way. So that's what we are slowly building in. And to maybe to Sumner's point, you could look at what bonuses look like, you know, around the, the region for coaches and where we are on that range and, and if there's a proposal for something more. That I she she I has did. already done oh, that. Okay. And they're all low. They're all paltry. The they're all low. Let that happen to them. Okay. So, I mean, Dale, do you think next month when you co you're coming next month? Yes. Okay. Do you think that next month you could at least come to us with, you know, to the point of, yes, we want to expand the budget, give us some ideas of what that would feel like and look like, and you could put some things up on the screen for us? I'm sure I can. Is that okay? Does that make sense? And I just, I just do, I do have one question, and it, it, it bugs me. Can we just hypothetically look at what it would be to fill teams? This is just for future, just talking, but we need to look at what it would be like if we were to have teams at collegiate. And the reason I say that is, I hear about Rep, I hear about Villa, I hear about Mercy, I hear about all these preparatory schools. And then when I look at the basketball for the girls, 13 girls on a 20 roster came from collegiate academy. So when you have problems at a school, maybe that might be something we need to look at because if you got 13 girls from outside Erie High, maybe there might be 13 inside Erie High who wouldn't have behavioral issues or some other things if they were able to play on the team. Just something, just if you could, I know, I know how collegiate was started, but I, I think about that all the time with the number of students out there and then the merging, some kids lost out on the scholarship from one school coming to another school and they don't get a chance to play because now we're going for the best, we're going for the cream. I understand that. But I've always, I have this concern. We're eerie high, but 13 of your people come from Collegiate Academy. There's young people at Erie High who might be able to play, stay out of trouble, graduate, do what they need to do if they had an opportunity. So just hypothetically, if you could give me an idea. Thanks. Okay. Sorry to put, oh, yeah, John, sorry. I think the answer that the TIAA wouldn't let us because some of the student body in the comes from outside the city limits and as, as such. <laughs> Could be accused of recruiting athletes from Albion or parts of the country. That's my recollection. Why are we thinking about I remember it was part of the negotiation simply uh, that, that they would not 
have their own sports teams was part of the deal of getting the school reopened. You know, it was negotiated at that time. At that time, the kids could play at Central, East, or Strong Vincent. Yeah. But, but part of getting that approved was saying, no, you're not going to, you know, we're not going to have expenditure for a separate sports program. I before I put in, I said I think the PFWA stepped in at that time and told us in addition to what you're saying that we could not be a super school and bring in kids from all over the county to and let them be athletes and compete because we'd be doing it with prep guys. I think I love when collegiate did come about it was a charter school. Yes, it was. So you had kids coming from Mill Creek, um, Gerard, whatever, and they didn't build the teams because the kids were eligible. That was their caveat to go back to their home schools and play on a team. And then the kids, my understanding from Erie High, don't those kids get a chance to try out for the team like the kids at collegiate? Well, then maybe that's part of the recruiting process that these kids aren't, you know, being recruited properly from Mary I. But it's kind of squeezed out players too because you know, there's three schools and so some kids are less off. That might still be talented. I think it's funny that. And I was reading an article that was written, what, 2020 was just with the football team, but like, you know, how like, like about 20 kids or more were like failing, but you know, they went, like, somebody worked with them to get the grades up. Some kids are moving to come to school and get playing sports, but but the merging definitely allows a lot of people who especially can still compete at a high level. I just actually look at it because the intramurals don't get you a scholarship. And so also, Dale, maybe, I don't know, is there a freshman team and a JV team and a varsity, you know, are there other levels, too, that you could help us with an expansion of the program that could include more kids that's truly the PIAA, you know, not intramural? That might be another thing to look at. We gave you a lot of work. I'm sorry. Okay. We just need to help. I'm just so thrilled that we're a sports board now. I mean, I'm loving it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Shree. And thank you, Mr. Nichols. You have a second item? Do you want to do it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll make this quicker. You know, as I reported the board a couple months ago, we didn't do it, any assessment appeals that related to this huge transaction that your insurance made, and it involves several hundred thousand a year in school tax. Uh, Angela was nice enough to find our policy, which uh, deals with that. And we leave this to the discretion of our professionals, which I disagree with. I think this board is not a toothless organization. I don't get a salary. I'm not afraid to take on your insurance. The Knox firm, I think, is afraid to take on your insurance. And they're not the only one. So... What I'm going to do, I'm going through all of what they did last year to see if they missed anything else, in my judgment. You can get this off the county assessment, what the sales were during the year. And I'm going to bring it up through the current year. And I'm going to make up a list. I'm going to send it to Attorney Wasson, who works on the appeals. And, you know, he's had quite a bit of success over the years. And I'm going to put down why I think the appeal should be filed, and he can respond and say, no, I disagree. And then, you know, refer it back to the board. We can cons consider uh, what we should do, but we've got to protect our tax base. We're not likely to get a new assessment anytime soon. Uh, the values are, are, are moving up in the city and we need to participate. And the only way we're going to participate is by filing assessment appeals and uh, you know, tracking new construction and such, although the new construction all involves LERDA, but we just need to be more aggressive on this because until there's a reassessment, uh, we're not going to reflect the increases in value except property by property by property. And this could, this could be the path for the next five years. As everybody knows there was an assessment in from 69 to about 2003, 
30 some years with the same assessment. So people in Erie were subsidized and people on the lake at Fairview. Didn't make sense, but that's what happened. And uh, the, the assessment was done 2003 and again, 10 years later, the 10 years is up. So what's happened now, the last assessment was done by the county itself, their own staff. So they saved a lot of money. They don't want to do that again. It was a, a lot of work. They did a good job. It was a lot of work. It's like six or seven million dollars. So it's just like we have issues with the budget that we can't address. The county <clears throat> council is likely to keep punting this down the road. So I, I really think we've got to focus on these assessment appeals as ways to expand our tax base. So once I get that completed and over to attorney Bassone to get a chance to review it, I'll have something to bring back. And that's it on that. Thank you, Mr. Nichols, for all that work. Questions on that one? So, Sumner, just so I understand, you're going to do some work there and send it over to Mr. Musone. Right. And then, I mean, at some point, would it be helpful for him to come and present to us? You know, on I, I'm just wondering it how you want be. this to come back well, to the board. I, I want to put down what I'm thinking, and he can respond. Okay. And I'm thinking we had appeals that weren't taken because of sheer staff. People, you know, your insurance, I'm their neighbor down there. My broken down building is right up on them. They bought to the south. They're all around me and they're formidable. Uh, uh, but I want him to do it in writing, what his response is. And then, yeah, we, we can have a meeting and discuss the, what we should or shouldn't do. But I think we need to be aggressive on the appeal. If you have... For example, we had a, a relative victory a few months ago when when uh, Tim reported that the new Erie Insurance Building was assessed at two hundred dollars a foot. Well, compared to the existing headquarters, the main headquarters, which was at eighty, my own house is at a hundred. Eighty dollars a foot. That building at six and French, two hundred was a relative victory. But then you have the cardiac unit that was built down at Hammond. That's assessed at 375000 Well, they're going to say, well, gee, your insurance is at two hundred. You know, they're going to bring us down. These companies need to spend money on education in the city because the benefit of your insurance is not to the city of Erie. Their employees don't live in the city of Erie. And their offices are in the city. We need to be fairly, uh, get our fair share of the values of their properties, and we aren't getting that now. Our expert is is their re real estate agent. So, it, you know, it's a small town. We're going to have overlaps like that. But that's why I'm working on this. I'm independent. So you'll keep us posted on your work, and then yes. if there's a time for presentation, you'll let us know so we can put on the agenda. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Any other matter from any other board members? Yes, yeah. Mr. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. The marching band. I would like to see the marching band grow. How can we go about recruiting? Cool. So, um, I actually, I was ready with an answer. I, I, do, I do have an answer. We have been working very closely with Mr. Gilmore, um, Mr. Nicholas, to develop a plan and a framework to start to recruit, expand, and give kids those experiences in the younger grades as they grow up. So we are working on it currently. Mr. Polito is a band guy, just so you know. He's not a sports guy. He's a band guy. He'll support that. Yes. I was in band. I was in band. <laughs> John, you had something as well? Just an anecdote that when we were talking about the furniture, which I reiterate, I supported what Neil outlined and said. I think the marks are not going to have a level of quality that or the cheap end is brought to mind a uh, story that I'll um, take from myself. Uh, it, it's just worth a mention. I didn't mention at the time because I thought that Neil might think I'm reflecting on him. But in the early 1970s, when St. Joseph's orphanage ceased to be an orphanage, the diocese of Erie leased that building to the school district, which opened it, and which opened it as a Model Middle School, it was called. It was, the name of it was Project Individual. It was supposed to be creativeness, uh, and the kids to 
didn't have to sit down. They could have kind of wandered and go. It's kind of a loose approach to education. And to to furnish the school, what was used was what was in there. And desk, teacher's desks and student desks that had been in our storage. Well, it wasn't long before someone took a look at it and said, this doesn't fit the concept. And we've got to get some uh, up-to-date furniture and some, they called it modular. It was like trapezoid shaped desk that could be put together even in optical and rectangles and to suit the circumstances. And anyway, the, the tubular steel uh, with the fiberboard uh, surfaces was, was what they went with. Well, the punchline is the school district employees who made the transition were up on the fourth floor throwing out oak tables and oak desks and they were landing on the lawn four stories below and they weren't breaking. And the public was walking by seeing it and saying, you're throwing this stuff out? And they just said, yeah, help yourself. And so they all went to have pickup trucks and took it. And the furniture that came in, the modular tubular furniture, lasted two or three years in the garage. <laughs> so we were guilty of throwing out better than we got. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to imply this. You know, Neil's remarks spoke to that type of so I don't want you to feel uneasy. I want you to laugh along with us. <laughs> it's a story worth learning, but it's kind of a lesson. Not to be, uh, you know, everything new is important. Mr. Harper, if we get you pictures, I can guarantee you that whatever we get is better than what we have. I don't think we have All a right. classroom in your that's eye it. that has matching furniture. I, uh, I a lot of that just... stuff that you said woke up in the years, we're still using it. <laughs> well, actually, the gym at Irving was filled with trap tables up until uh, about, I don't know, four weeks ago. But that wouldn't have survived the toss on the fourth. Yeah, no, probably not. It would have. All right. Okay, on that note, no other matter. We will adjourn, but before we do that, I want to announce we will go into an exec executive session. I believe we have some legal and personnel matters. Am I right about that? Okay. Let's see and safety matters. We'll take five minutes for a quick bathroom break. We can lean in here for executive. We are adjourned.